This is James, coming from a Genuine Custom Audio in Riverside, California. I started doing car stereos in about high school. I've been in the cars my whole life. My older brother and my dad, they were in the cars, so I was out there always helping them and stuff like that, but I just got a passion for the audio. So uh, I started to do a lot, of, a lot of cars in my front yard back in uh, Chino. I started to get really, really busy, and uh, the city of Chino and the Chino Police Department came to my house, and they said I was running a full-fledged business out of the house, and I couldn't do it. So they shut me down. They told me if they seen any cars in my front yard, they were gonna find me. So that ended that. Now I got a shop in Chino and I don't know what to do. I got a couple customers, but then it started to get really slow. It started to get slow to a point where the shop was super clean and I had nothing to do. So then I would go next door to the upholstery guy, see if he had work. The marathon inspired me so much, I started to uh, really follow Nip's movement. So I started to hit all his concerts, all his shows. And then out of nowhere, I get a call from my friend, RJ. Hits me up, says, hey bro, never believe it. Says, I got you the Laker car. Said, the what? Says, Snoop's Laker car. He's like, I need you, uh, I need you to go uh, over to this address and check it out. I thought he was lying to me. So I go over and I check it out and yeah, there it was. Snoop's Laker car, the convertible yellow Pontiac. Crazy, go over there and get a wiring issue with it. He said when the music will play and he will go to hit the convertible top to open and close, that the whole sound system would cut off, his lights would dim, everything would just like malfunction. So I checked it out. I said, you know what, bring it down to the shop and let me look at it. I had to redo the whole car. I'm glad I took pictures of everything. But once I was done with it, the car had no problem. And I actually heard that Snoop was really, really happy with it. I started to see how the shop was progressing really good. And I really had Nipsey Hussle to thank for it. His music really inspired me. So uh, I used to go down to his Crenshaw store all the time. And I used to buy his clothes and hang out with everyone right there at the shop. And every time I'd visit, I noticed that it'd be really quiet. So I told Ann, hey bro, you know what? I'm gonna build you guys a music box right here. So at first I don't think they believed me. So one day I started it. I just came up with something and it came out pretty dang good. So after I finished it up, I went down to the shop and I delivered it. And man, that thing turned out to be a big hit. I ended up, he ended up releasing the Crenshaw album, $100 mixtape, supported it fully, stood in line, got the CD, worked every penny, don't doubt it. Then he threw the secret concert. That was the baddest concert ever. That day was dope. And that's the day I got to meet Pac-Man. I met, I seen Pac-Man for the first time at the House of Blues in Hollywood. It was a Nipsey Hustle show. And uh, he came on before Nip, him, Newport, and Conrad. One of his songs, I forgot the name of it, but he says, uh, if you want to, to, to talk to me, just email me. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna give this a try. So I emailed him. He hit me back. We just started bouncing back and forth to emails. I let him know who I was. I was the dude always going to the Nipsey show. He said he recognized me. So uh, we end up, I end up letting him know I do crazy custom stereos and everything. So we agreed to meet up one day, but he wanted to meet up on his neighborhood on 11th Ave. I said, okay. So I ended up taking two cars down there. I ended up taking a Suburban I did, and I took a white Dodge Ram I did. One was a sound quality car, no bass, but just, it was all done by Hertz. Uh, very, uh, very nice sound quality car. And then I took a Suburban I did, 
which was an SPL car. Took it down there, I met him, I showed him my car, and once he seen the work I did, he knew I was serious. And from there, a friendship just bought, just bloomed, you know? So, things were going good for a while. Doing a lot of work, a lot of custom stuff, boats, like I said, everything. But then, it got slow again. Got pretty slow, probably after the, I don't know, sixth or seventh year doing it, if I recall. Uh, then I got a job opportunity for one of my homies, Clint, calls me up. Says, uh, hey man, I got a job for you. Says, working at the sheriff's department, putting computers in the, their whole little unit, installing all those. Like government job benefits. It's like, man. So I'm gonna close up the shop. Thinking about it. I actually put my application in. Everything. And then one of my good, good friends, Alex Ocon, gives me a call. Says, hey man. So how you doing? I was like, I'm good. And you? I think I'm all right. He's like, I remember uh, Eddie Lamelli from high school. And I was like, yeah, that sounds familiar. You know, I'm better with faces than I am names. He's like, yeah, man, he's looking for a sound system right now in one of his cars, and he's got a couple cars. I was like, really? I was like, man, you know, I could, do, I, I, I could use the work right now. So I ended up jumping up on Instagram, and I hit up Eddie. Eddie's like, all right, yeah, here's my address. Pull up. So I go down there, check out his car. It was uh, El Camino. What year? 84. It was a 1984 El Camino. Uh, go to his house, I pull up to his house, and we look at it, and he had all this stuff. So he tells me everything he wants to get done. Boom, we agree on the price, and we do it. I do that car at his house. Knock it out real fast. Uh, the after the El Camino, he, he had a, a Monte Carlo Super Sport. So we came up with a pretty crazy idea on that one. Figured out to use a lot of plexiglass, a lot of LED lights. We did a lot of uh, a lot of detail in that one. We ran the Sherman Vega in that one. That one came out really nice. Then we ended up doing another Monte Carlo. Uh, we ran a Sherman Vega Stroker and some Hyponics amps in that. That one came out good. And then uh, while I was working on that one, uh, he pitched the idea, we started talking, and uh, he asked me, you know, who, who else helps you out and all that. I was like, no, it's just me, you know. And I started giving him the idea that I wanted to go to the school, Mobile Solutions in Arizona. I really like how their work is done and how they fabricate stuff and they offer a, a little program there, a three, four day program where you go and they teach you. So I was telling Eddie about that and I was showing him the work. So uh, he pitched the idea, he goes, well, why don't we just partner up? How does this happen? I got a job where I could go work for the county, be set, or do I gamble and see how far the stereo stuff goes? I took the gamble. So I called him up and I said, you know what, bro? Plans came. I'm gonna keep the shop and I'm gonna keep going. Chase my dream, I chase my passion. And now I'm here. I don't regret nothing. I love every decision I made, you know? Every job is different. Every experience is different. Everything I do is different. I could have been doing the same car, the same thing every day. I would have drove me crazy. I love what I do. I love knowing that I don't know what the next project's gonna be, what the customer's gonna want, what their mind has in store for me, you know? I love that. So we took some time to think of what we can do that's a little different than what everyone else is doing. So Eddie came up with the idea and asked me, can you duplicate the front end of this car? And I, I kind of laughed and I was like, what? 
He goes, yeah, can you make a smaller version? I started looking at it and I was like, nah, I can't do it. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, nah, it's gonna be too hard. And he's like, nah, you could do it. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe. And I start really looking at it, really looking at it and breaking it down in my mind. And I was like, you know what? I think I could do this. So I went at it. Started to build it, started to put my build on Instagram, started to tell a few close friends. They told me I was never gonna do it. It was too hard. That it's gotta look really, really close to it. It's, it's, just wait till it's done. Just wait till it's done. It took me a little while, you know, something I've never done before. But uh, I think I did a pretty dang good job. We ended up building it. We sit it in the trunk and then we built a theme for it. And the theme is the car driving down PCH. And it came out really good. We ran two DC-10 level threes in a sealed box. We got uh, three Hertz amplifiers in there and the Hertz uh, millis, five and a quarters, front and back. Built a custom center console, built the rear pods, built a rear package tray. And of course, the whole custom trunk and everything was rewired. We hit all the wires so you don't see nothing. And so once that car was built, it took a little while, but it was a, a full custom build. But once it was built, it got the attention of a lot of people. A lot of people were very impressed with that. Uh, once again, my buddy RJ, he pulls through and he links me up with Albert D'Alba, a uh, very famous painter. Uh, and good friend of mine and he hit me up and he wanted me to do one of his cars his son's car he said that SEMA had sponsored or how they he said that House of Color sponsored it for SEMA and they wanted a really really crazy trunk build so he came up with a crazy build and he told me he just wanted to paint everything. He just wanted to see the pump and candy paint. So I said, okay. But he said, you got like two to three weeks to build it because we still need to paint it. So a lot of late nights at the shop. Took the car in. I was super happy to work on it. The car was a very beautiful car. I covered and masked the whole thing. I wanted to make sure the whole car was protected. I closed up the shop when I worked on this thing, but we got the car knocked out. I fiberglassed the whole trunk. Everything comes off like a puzzle. If, if you don't know how the trunk operates, you will not know how to take that trunk apart. But we got it done, we got it knocked out. It was a very nail-biting build. I mean, really pushing the time clock on that one. But we got it done, we got it out to SEMA. We got the, it was set up very beautifully. The, the Dialbas took us out to SEMA with them. I wanna thank them very much for that. It was a, a very pleasurable experience. But to see the shops work, sitting in SEMA with the crowd around it, it was very, very good feeling. And I started to get a lot of nice cars asking me to do work. And I started to notice I was outgrowing the Chino shop. So we had to move. So a spot came up here in Riverside. And when I first heard about it, and I first came down here and seen it, I didn't think, I didn't think we were gonna get this place. This place was way too big. I was like, nah, it's, it's, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even open for it. And Eddie kept pushing, nah, we're gonna get it. We're gonna get it, bro. Don't trip, we're gonna get it. I was like, I don't know. It's pretty big, you know? And by the grace of God, we got it. It wasn't pretty. It was not pretty. But I wasn't looking at that. I seen what this place could be and what it was going to be. And so me and Eddie sat down, we came up with a battle plan, started to come up with ideas, ideas, ideas. And then once everything was agreed and final, everything went to work. 
we broke down this big 22 foot wall that was separating both shops so we can have one big open shop. We epoxied the floors, we scrubbed the walls, painted them. We, uh, the homie Gordon came down, started talking to him about some murals we could get going. And uh, we ended up picking Jesse James and Chip Foos because they're very ins inspirational. We picked Jesse James because he, him too, came up from the ground up. He came from nothing. I started in the front yard, you know, now I'm here. Uh, he does everything himself. He gets dirty and what he builds is crazy. I give that guy the utmost props. And uh, Chip Foos also has crazy creations. He puts it down on paper and then from paper it comes to life. And I do a lot of my my uh, my renderings and drawings based off of that. And put it on paper. Then it came to my favorite part was building the wood shop, the fabrication room. I had 12 feet by 36 feet to play with. So I sat down one night by myself and I figured uh, figured out how I wanted to lay out my wood shop. I wanted it to do it to make it easiest for me because I'm here by myself all the time and make it simplify things. I have uh, two router tables. I have a big six foot by four foot work table. I got, you know what? Let me just show you, check it out. Right here behind us, I got two router tables. I got my chop saw over there, sanders. All my templates are right here. I got an air filtration system, and I keep all my router bits, screws, drill bits, everything over here. So everything I create, I can, I have everything in here that I need to create. This is where I spend most of my time. If it's not tearing apart the car, it's in here. a little bit about me thank you for watching and stay tuned for some more work at a genuine custom audio thank you